right, folks. Uh, so it's uh, just after 3.30 local time. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Andre Bauer from the University of Ljubljana, who will tell us about synthetic, synthetic mathematics with an excursion to computability theory. Andre, take it away. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to speak at your seminar. And hopefully one day I can also visit. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't traveled much around the middle, down the middle of the US. I've been mostly on the East Coast when I studied in Pittsburgh. I've been to the West Coast a couple of times, but I mostly just flew over Midwest, except for Sher Urbana Champagne. Okay, anyhow. Um, so today I'd like to speak about uh, synthetic mathematics. So maybe the first thing to uh, um, the first thing to uh, do here is to explain the words. So um, it is often often said that Euclid's geometry is synthetic, but Descartes' Cartesian geometry is analytic. So what do people uh, understand? What do we understand when we say these words synthetic and analytic? Um, you could, uh, you could um, combine it like this, I mean, you could explain it like this, in the synthetic approach, we have some basic objects of interest, like points and lines, and these are taken to be primitive, that is to say they are just primitive notions, whose properties and relations and structure are then axiomatized. So, in particular, in synthetic geometry, for instance, in the plane, it's important to note that a line is not seen as a set of points because there are no sets. There are just lines and points and then maybe circles or some other shapes. But uh, a there, is a, there, is a, there is a the relation of a point uh, being a member of a line, so uh, coinciding with a line, but that's not to be read in a set theoretic way. And then all of geometry is done within the axiomatic system. So you never look out, you just use whatever is available given to you from the uh, initial axioms and basic notions. In the analytic approach, we do it slightly differently. We uh, construct the basic objects or uh, that, that, we, that we're interested in, um, or sometimes maybe we don't construct them, but we definitely take them apart. But it's better to think that we just construct them. For instance, in Cartesian geometry, we view the plane as a Cartesian product of two copies of real numbers. So a point is constructed as a pair of real numbers. And the line is constructed as a certain subset of the plane, not an any, not any subset, but certain subsets of the plane of R, of R cross R are then um, called the lines. And the things are then set up in such a way that the properties of these uh, objects of interest, of interest are, are deduced. So we don't have any axioms on top of whatever our, the environment that we work in gives us. Um, and we can, we can then just work this way. Now, each approach has its advantages. In the synthetic one, you're often forced to do things in a very, uh, in, in a very uh, frugal way, which exposes the essence of an argument and um, is often quite, can be quite slick. Whereas the analytic approach uh, is kind of a, 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 gives you a good tool set to work with. It provides a, 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 an unlimited set of methods with which you can attack the problem. You want to drag in some algebra, of course you can do it, you know, or topology, whatever, you can always do it. So the analytic approach um, also has its advantages. Now, um, oh, I'm trying to sync the slides here, okay. Um, we would like to, so the Euclid's geometry is about a single structure. It's just about the Euclidean plane. But suppose you wanted to develop the sort of the same thing, synthetic methods uh, for an entire branch of mathematics. Say you wanted to have synthetic differential geometry. So that wouldn't just speak about a single smooth manifold. That would be something that speaks about all of synthetic differential geometry. And we would assume that, you know, just like in Euclidean geometry, you only have lines and points, you don't have things that are irrelevant to uh, Euclidean geometry. In synthetic differential geometry, for example, certainly you would expect to have the fact that all maps are smooth. 
And you can play this game with various kinds of various branches of mathematics. For instance, in synthetic topology, you would go by a slogan that says, well, everything has a topology. Every, maybe every, 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 everything's a space would be the natural thing to say there. And all maps are continuous. And today I'm going to speak a little more closely about synthetic computability, where of course you would expect to have something like all maps are computable, or that somehow computability is built into the system from the very start. It's not something that you construct, it's just given. Um, in fact, all of these branches and some others have been developed in this synthetic way. Um, it would take too much time to give a, a proper historical account here, um, but let me just spend a couple of minutes saying a, some, a little bit about the ones that we have listed here. So the, I think the oldest one is synthetic differential geometry where it was consciously created in this synthetic way. And this was done, what was that? A second half of 60s probably started uh, by Eduardo Dubuc and Bill Levere and Anders Koch and others. Okay, we have a Zoom bomber. Hi, can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, I just want to get a sense of what you mean by synthetic versus um, um, I think we'll have to deal with the Zoom bombers first, sorry. Okay. Maybe you'll have to, uh, Stephen, you are muted. If you're talking, we can't hear you. But uh, if this goes on, then uh, there are a couple of things you should be doing, which okay, is- Okay, so, sorry, I, I just removed the person. Yeah. I, I think I identified the person, sorry. Okay, okay. continue okay. please, sorry. Thank you. Okay, so um, can I continue with my question? Sure, please, sorry. Okay, so for example, let's take a look at um, Birkhoff's axioms for planar geometry. This is the, you know, the set of postulates for planar geometry where um, he does take lines um, and points to be um, undefined entities, but then he introduces the postulate of angle measure, you know, the third postulate, and he talks about continuity over there. He assumes continuity. So um, a, a, a situation like this where you have, um, you know, purely synthetic entities like points and lines in the, sen in the classical sense, and then all of a sudden you, you drop this, uh, continuity, basically assumption of real numbers and all that stuff. Um, what is your take on this? Is this synthetic or is this analytic or is it a hybrid of the two? Uh, okay, I'm actually going to discuss this point. Namely, the, the question, as I understand it, is that in fact, to, to, for, for, to reasonably work, you need a, a good enough expressive language. So you cannot really get away with just points and just lines. You want more than that. And I'm going to address this specifically in a moment. And then uh, once I've spoken about uh, uh, the setup uh, with the effective topos and the higher order logic, if I haven't answered your question, just speak up again, okay? Okay. Egbert, is your raise hand? Is your hand raised? Yes, my hand was raised. Thank you. Um, uh, so, with synthetic differential geometry, you said the objects are smooth manifolds, and with topo topology, there are spaces. But with synthetic com computability, you didn't say what the objects are. Because I will explain in detail what they are. Ah, okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. So let me just say on this slide that um, synthetic topology uh, arose also from synthetic domain theory, which was maybe a little more specialized to theoretical computer science. And this was done by Martin Escardo and Paul Taylor and Davorin Leshnik and also by myself a little bit. And it will builds on work done in the 1980s on, on synthetic domain theory. And I'm going to speak about synthetic computability. I want to illustrate the approach using synthetic computability because it's maybe the closest to, uh, uh, to, lo to logic, uh, um, but, but I think there's some value in, in looking at these other things. Also, I should maybe mention that um, uh, other branches are, uh, other approaches are things like synthetic um, uh, algebraic geometry, uh, and and uh, synthetic um, measure theory, but I really don't have the time to go into this now. If you ask me later, I can give you references. So let's uh, let's press on. Um, so as logicians, we can recast this synthetic analytic business in, in a more familiar terms, namely um, synthetic 
is synthetic, is theory, analytic is model, and they're related by an interpretation, if you think about it, right? So you have the first order theory of um, Euclidean geometry. The model is the structure, namely the plane, the uh, Cartesian product of reals, with the, you know, and, and, and then you have the basic predicates and, and everything, and you interpret things. And that's one view to view synthetic versus analytic. Um, and this is a useful view that we're going to uh, use here to explain what's going on. Now, to capture, and so for, 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 ge for Euclidean geometry, this is just going to, you can get away with something like a first order structure is the model, and the first order theory is the theory. You can do that. But if you want to do real, a whole branch of mathematics, and you want to speak about um, high order things like topologies, which are families of, of opens, and, and maybe for manifolds, you need to be able to form uh, all kinds of manifolds and, and these all should all exist in, in, in one theory. The notion of theory has to be uh, more expressive and the notion of model will become also more complicated. It has to be richer. So one thing that has worked well in these approaches is to take toposes as models. Now toposes are, um, I'm assuming I'm talking to logicians here. So toposes are, um, models of higher order logic. That's one way to view them. Usually it's in, in, for many, many naturally arising toposes, it's intuitionistic higher order logic. Um, and so uh, that's maybe not so familiar to this audience, but doesn't matter. it doesn't matter because we don't really need to know any details on how this works. And if you're familiar with set theories, you can think of a topos, you can think of a higher order logic as something like bounded Zermelo set theory. That is to say, all quantifiers are bounded, separation is bounded, um, there's no replacement, and it's intuitionistic. Um, and uh, topos is then like a kind of set theoretic model. Okay, so. Uh, How will this work in our case? So we're going to use the effective topos, um, which was which was um, discovered by Martin, Martin Highland in the 1980s. And uh, there was a specific search for this topos. It's, people expected it to be there. And uh, so uh, it's um, when it was found, that was a, a, a big thing in, 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 well, in a certain corner of computability that's married to category theory. Uh, its internal language is higher order logic. Um, so it's a kind of a very limited set theory. It's actually intuitionistic. That's what the I in IHOL stands for. And the interpretation is Kleene's realizability interpretation, which I'm going to review. But before we look at the closer, uh, closer look at these ingredients, let me, say, let, me, let me explain what our method will be. Okay, so here's the typical method on how you start how you do the synthetic thing, at least how you get started, okay? So you take a classic theorem in computability theory, you know, Rice's theorem, whatever. You then rephrase it as a fact about the effective topos, which is usually not very complicated. Um, you just need to compute, you know, a little bit to see how this, how, it, how it plays, you know, what role it plays in the structure of the topos. It's usually pretty straightforward. And then you reverse engineer you're the fact about the effective topos so that you find a statement such that if you interpret it, it expresses that fact. Now you have a statement in the higher order logic. So on the synthetic side, you now have a statement which says something about the effective topos and the something corresponds to classic theorem. Usually this first statement that you find is kind of clumsy, is not very nice, but then you have to think about it. So by the way, the first three steps are more or less just technique. It's just about being used, knowing enough, knowing enough computability theory and being able to work with the technical details of the topos and the realizability interpretation. But then the real synthetic part starts because now you work synthetically on the, uh, uh, on the synthetic side, so axiomatically using only your higher order logic, and you try to massage your statement into usually something more general and more abstract, which, however, becomes a lot more succinct 
and come, it sort of, it exposes the essence of what is going on. And I'm going to show you examples of this. And then of course, after that, you want to give a nice synthetic proof. You want the proof to be, again, abstract and conceptual, and you don't want to just copy and reverse engineer the thing that people do with Turing machines. In fact, we're never going to, the idea is never to, men, to never mention any Turing machine or computation or anything like that, just to do what people would consider straight math, although unusual math, but ordinary math in uh, the synthetic world. So this is just an intro where we, we're going to show you examples of this. Okay, so what's this effective topos business? Um, it's a bit complicated to describe. If you have never seen it, then there would be a probably little uh, point in trying to explain to it, unless you're quite familiar with intuitionistic models of set theory or things like things like that. But luckily, I don't have to explain the entire effective topos to you for most purposes and for your intuition. It's enough that I explain a particular full subcategory of the topos, which is called assemblies. And this is a very intuitive structure. The assemblies are very intuitive, and I think it's just generally good to know about them. So here's what an assembly is. It is quite literally the formal expression of the idea that mathematical objects can be coded with numbers. It's just that, okay? So let's have a look. So an assembly A is a set A together with a relation, and this is the coding relation, and there are various ways to express the coding relation, and here's one. So the coding relation relates numbers to elements. So when we say, when we say here, when you have n, and then this relation x, we call this n realizes x, or sometimes we say n implements x, or n, real, n codes x. Think of n as the Gödel code of x. So that's the common idea here is that this is just Gödel coding formalized a little more carefully than what you would normally do and it done in, in, a, in a sufficient generality so that we're going to get a nice category out of this. One requirement that we have is that every uh, element has to have at least one code. So this is this, right? For every element, oh, sorry, this should be, um, oh, I have that, I can do these things. So here. Every element has to have at least one code. And notice that we allow X to have many codes. So there could be many numbers that code the same thing. Like for instance, many numbers code the same partial, com partial computable map. We also allow something that is sl slightly unusual from the traditional point of view, which is that an, this, a number may code several elements. That's a lot more, that's unusual, but we allow it and it's useful and we'll see why it's useful. So the only thing we require is that every number, every element has to have at least one code. There is a corresponding notion of amorphism, which I call here an assembly map. Often it's called realized map, which is a map uh, on, it's just a function on the underlying sets, which is tracked by a computable map. What does that mean? So that means we can find some computable map. Here it is which does to realizers whatever f does to elements. So if I take some, so if I have, if n is the code of x, then this phi k has to compute a code for f of x. So the computable map that tracks f does whatever f does at the level of realizers. And I think both of these definitions are quite natural and are used maybe not explicitly, um, but definitely this sort of thing is always used in computability theory. So, so I think Andre, it's nice to formalize them. Yes. Andre, uh, can I rub for a sec? So, sure. I mean, this, this looks very much like the Russian theory of uh, numberings. Oh, oh, thank you. Yes, I was going to mention that. Um, this is a slight generalization of the Russian uh, theory of numbered sets um, uh, by Ershov. Uh, he has an additional requirement, which is that a number can uh, realize at most one element. If, if, I, if you insert here, also the requirement, not only that for every X that exists an N, such that N realizes X, but if N realizes X and Y, then they must be equal, then you get precisely numbered sets. No, actually, so there's an no, X. That, that, that's actually free for numbering. I mean, that's a special kind of number. Oh, wait, uh, so numbered sets are the total numberings, right? And then you have the partial numberings. 
And so right, partial numbers so, where you get a subset, but 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 you, what you have as, as assembly is precisely what the Russians call numbering. Um, and, and maybe I've it's seen many like numbers. I've seen step, so just careful just, because I think some Russian texts will require also that if n realizes x and n realizes y then x must equal y that's a common requirement it depends oh, a little oh, bit oh 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 i see right yes yes you're yeah. right yes i see yeah. sorry yes you're right so this i think is slightly more general it doesn't quite get you to the topos but it gets you a very nice category that has lots of good properties type theorists like it because it gives a wealth of models for type theories and so on okay um so let's look at some examples of assemblies. So first of all, the usual objects that arise in computability theory are easily expressed as assemblies. For instance, the natural numbers are, well, just the natural numbers where every number is realized by itself. There is nothing to discuss here, right? Or if you take computable maps, which in the effective topos will be excite exactly the exponential n to the n, so it will be the, this will be the object of all maps from n to the n in the topos. Um, you take the computer, the total computable maps are, you know, in memory of them being called recursive a long time ago. So you take the computable maps n to the n, and then you just, as the realizers, you just take the standard coding, which we say, if, well, f is realized by n if, if the nth partial map is, is, is the map f. Um, you could also uh, enumerate computably, you can also, uh, you can also present computably enumerable sets as an assembly. And again, it's a very familiar thing. You just take all the computably enumerable sets and then the coding is the standard one that you would expect. And these are reasonable definitions and they will be used uh, in what we do. So slightly more unusual is this ability to code for, for the same number to code many elements. And here is the extreme such situation. You take uh, any set X and then this Nabla X is the assembly whose, well, it's the set X, but it's computability structure is trivial. That is to say, you let every number realize every element of X, yes? So this looks ridiculous at first, but it gives a nice functor from sets to the effective topos and to assemblies actually. And so this is a, this is a sub, oops. This is a subcategory of the effective topos. So it gives a nice functor it has an adjoint and so on. But most importantly, what this thing does is it allows us to speak up, it allows us to parameterize a, a theorem, a construction or anything by a set X in a non-uniform way. So if, if this Nabla X appears as a parameter, because its realizers are completely uninformative, you get a realizer, you know, have no idea which element we're talking about. This realizer does not participate in any computation. So this, is what is needed to express uh, non-uniform parameterizations in, in computability theory. When people discuss that some theorem is uniform or non-uniform in a given parameter, this is the road to that sort of talk in the uh, synthetic way. Okay, questions? Okay, so let's see. Um, next, let's have some uh, observations about Two element assemblies. Now, um, there's just one, they, you know, up to isomorphism, there's just one two element set, but there are three topological spaces on two points. So there are many assemblies on two elements, and some of them are quite relevant to what we want to do. So, for instance, first you have the Boolean truth values, and so that would be the set with two elements, bottom and top, where you realize bottom with zero and top with one. So this is going to lead to computations where you explicitly have a zero or a one, or you explicitly have to output a zero, or you have to output a one if you're mapping into two. Then another possibility would be the semi-decidable truth values. So that would be the set bottom and top. And now the relation is that you take 
you say that bottom is realized by the non by the elements of the non halting the complement of the halting set and top is realized by the uh, codes of from the the halting set so what will oh oh this should be sigma oh, no sigma i mean s sorry this is s here um what is why is this why does this correspond to semi decidable truth values well think of it this way when you get your n here okay you get your n and this n is coding one of these two truth values how do you find out which one it is well intuitively speaking you run f phi n n and you get some computation and it's going and it's going and it's going if it ever terminates then you know that you got true and if it doesn't terminate you never get to know that it doesn't terminate so truth is semi decidable here you can decide that you got truth but you can never decide that you got false so that's why it's the semi decidable truth value so this is how you can code semi decidability and then we have the classical truth values which is where we would just use nabla2 where we have no no information uh on um on the coding so the num you get the number you have no idea what truth value it's coding and this can then be used to express the idea of a decision procedure or a subset so for instance if you have a map an assembly map from a to two that's like a decision procedure because it's tracked by something and the the thing that tracks is the decision procedure because it has to on every element on every realizer of a it has to output either zero on the war one and so it gives you a decision whereas the semi decision procedures are correspond to maps from a to s because these you know when they output something they output a code of a computation and then you know you can run the computation and try to observe that it terminates and then you know it's true and so you get precisely the semi decidable things and then of course if you go from a to nabla2 that's just like arbitrary subset any set theoretic function because you can realize that by a machine that just always outputs 42 or whatever because it doesn't have to do it doesn't have to witness anything and in fact it's a nice exercise to figure out how many two element assemblies there are and there are many and they correspond to well known well known notion of reducibility in um, in computability theory okay so um let's look at the logic the, this is the realizability interpretation of log of intuitionistic logic uh, it was first given by Kleene, who was essentially uh, formalizing the brouwer heitinkel kolmogorov of uh, the meaning of constructive logic, and he was using re recursive functions and recursive uh, uh, computability theory to do it. Um, so in this logic, instead of explaining what it means for a statement to be true, we explain what it means for a number to realize a statement. And then the truth value of a statement is the set of all of its realizers. And so if the set is empty, that means the statement is invalid. If the set contains some numbers, then it's valid because it's realized by those numbers. But there is an additional structure here because it may be quite important what this set of realizer looks like, especially when the statements start to interact with each other. Um, so how does this work? Uh, I don't know if we have to go through all of these, but it's just it's essentially really is just the BHK interpretation. So for instance, how do you realize a conjunction? Well, you uh, code this is a coding function for natural numbers you pair together two realizers one for m one for psi and then this this junction here you explicitly tag a realizer with zero or one so that you know whether you're realizing the first or the second disjunct and because you're doing this this is going to give us a sort of a computational uh meaning to disjunction where you actually when you're produce when you're realizing a disjunction you're deciding which of the two disjuncts holds because you're outputting either zero or one and you're giving a reason for why the disjunct holds okay. it's not just which one holds but also why it holds that's the end and then this five psi implication is realized by code of a function which converts realizers of phi to realizers of psi uh, and existentials in a similar way to the disjuncts have to produce an explicit witness for the existential witness so you have to produce a number that codes something that exists and so this number then informs you of what it is, what is the thing that exists and so then you can start combining things things and and and, and you know you pile them up and, and you get more complicated statements 
And a basic observation is that it is that intuitionistic logic is valid for this interpretation. That is to say, if you give an intuitionistic proof of a statement, then you can convert that proof to a specific realizer um, to, to a number. And this is a purely mechanical procedure, um, which gives you the number. And so that number, for instance, if it's something like an implication or a for all, actually codes some algorithm because it encodes some partial computable map that that does something useful and uh, this is how you can translate the abstract intuitionistic theorems from the synthetic world to very specific computational um, procedures and gadgets in computability theory it's useful to do though so one but once you get used to this sort of thing then eventually it becomes easier to do things just synthetically and not to always translate this way but it's a very good tool to learn uh, constructive reasoning um, because you can use it to think about you know am I what am I doing is does this make any sense and often you can if you understand this then you can often get a good feel for what is intuitionistically true because uh, if it's if it's intuitionistically true then it has a, a, a then it has a realizer and the realizer is just some algorithm or something so if it has a realizer there's a good chance that it's intuitionistically true by the way there are statements which are realized but are not provable in just pure intuitionistic logic okay um here's our first exercise how am i doing i should be careful about i should be careful about the time oh am i out of time no 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 oh, I started, you know, oh, started half past okay good yeah, almost yeah, half an hour. for some reason i thought we started one hour ago okay let's translate the definition let's try to get reverse engineer the two element sets that we had earlier on we had the two element sets where were they we're not that far away here this one this one so the boolean values the semi-decidable values the classical values let's try to reverse engineer them synthetically so you'd have to give definitions of assemblies in higher order logic so with essentially just like a kind of set theory and i'm going to use set theory set theoretic notation such that when you translate uh, using the structure of assemblies and the logic you get you don't get precisely these assemblies but you get something that's isomorphic to them in the category so that's good enough okay so the decidable truth value and now notice how the synthetic world starts to work beautifully the decidable truth values are the decidable truth values there is nothing to be said there you just say okay every topos has an object of truth values omega um, you can think of it as the power set of of the singleton but uh, that might not be very helpful if you are very classically minded because then you'll keep thinking that it's actually two but it isn't um and then the power set of any set a is just the set of all all internally right so this is now synthetically the set of all functions from a to omega is the power set um so in, in a way we are presenting the power set in terms of characteristic maps that for every a you get a truth value uh, for every element in a you get a truth value so that's the characteristic map of a, of a set of a subset of a so the decidable truth values are those truth values which are decidable so you can decide them p or not p um, and then if you think about what does this mean you will get well realizers will correspond to something that outputs either zero you know you have well we either have a zero or a one and then you can relate that to the old definition the semi-decidable truth values turn out to be the following so you take and this is a decidable predicate right two to the n so when you're existential oops i should be careful this thing here is just an existentially quantified decidable predicate so this is like a sigma one statement but it's not done in this synthetic way that a logician might expect where i would say well this is a schema and then here i have some some formula phi which has n as a variable and i wouldn't do it in this synthetic way i would uh, in this um, a syntactic way because i have higher order logic here i can just say well you take any map from n to two you existentially quantify like that you call this a semi-decidable truth value so the semi-decidable truth values are the ones that are existential quantification of decidable predicates on the natural numbers the classical truth values are the ones so notice the difference between this and this 
they are the ones that are not not stable. So they are the ones that are fixed points under double negation. And now again, you have to you know work through the uh, definition of realizability. Negation is defined as so. This is really P implies false. That's negation implies false implies P. And then you have to. Uh, you, it's better to do this in the privacy of your own notebook. Uh, figure out that this actually corresponds to the classical truth values. Okay, so that's something we can do. Now, an interesting thing is also that um, because the, uh, so the next thing that we're going to do is um, we'll prove some synthetic theorems, but before I show it to you, let me just say well, how we do this now. So because the realizability interpretation converts constructive proofs to computations, if you want, if you want to show, for instance, that some map is computable, all you need to do is, constr is to construct it. As soon as you have constructed a map, it's computable because uh, the realizability interpretation will compute its realizer and then you know, it's computable. It's, you'll, get a, you'll get a girl code for the map. And if you want to show that some map doesn't exist, then you just have to show that, well, it doesn't exist because that means that while there may be a classical such map, in the effective topos, it doesn't exist because if it did, it would be computable. So let's see an example of that. Um, let's prove the well-known uh, theorem that there is no computable enumeration of total recursive maps. Okay, so the total recursive maps do not have a computable enumeration. So how do we do that? Well, we're actually going to start with the theorem of Levier's, which is a fixed point theorem and is very simple theorem, but it's also very odd. So if you have a, it says this, suppose you have a subjective map from A to B to the A. So B to the A is just a set of all maps from A to B. So I have a map for every element of A, uh, sorry, I have a map E, which takes E A to B to the A, okay? If that's the case, then B has the fixed point property. That is to say, every endomap on B has a fixed point. Uh, it's the, uh, the proof is uh, the essence of diagonalization. I'm not going to go through the proof now. It's, it's three lines and it's just diagonalization. You just play games with this E and you self apply E to the Y to the Y and then magic, magic, diagonal, la la la, you get a fixed point. It's, it's, it's not a complicated proof. Observe that it's intuitionistic, therefore it holds in the effective topos. It holds in our synthetic computability world. Okay, so what is this good for? Well, by the, well, uh, if, well, one, op, one possibility is this, if B has a map that doesn't have a fixed point property, so the converse, if B has a map that doesn't have a fixed point property, then such a subjection cannot exist. So this gives us immediately, there is no subjection from N to N to the N. And uh, you have to compute what subjection means in the effective topos, and it means effectively subjective, that is to say, you have a map which goes from n to the n to the n, but you can also compute, uh, you, can co you can realize the statement that for all x in the codomain, for all y in the codomain, that exists something in the domain that hits it. But in any case, this now holds for the simple reason that the successor map does not have a fixed point. And now if we unravel all of this, we're just going to get the usual proof that uh, there is no total uh, computable enumeration. There is no computable enumeration of total computable maps. So that will be an example of a theorem that you can do synthetically. And notice we haven't actually used any axioms here. Okay, so here's another one. Now this one is now going in a slightly different direction or where, I would, because I want to emphasize that often the amount of abstraction that you perform when you take a classical theorem of, uh, when you take a, a traditional theorem of, uh, of, of computability theory and you massage it synthetically, what you're left with is something that is not easily recognizable as the original theorem. Nevertheless, it exposes the essence of the theorem. So here's one, which I claim is Rice's theorem, but you cannot know that by just by looking at this theorem. So it says, if, has, if A has the fixed point property, that is to say, if every endomap on A has a fixed point, then every map from A to the decidable truth values is constant. Um, proof, well, here's the proof. Again, I don't know if it's, uh, it's, it's better if, if you're interested in the proof, uh, you can take five minutes and, 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 and uh, look at the slides later on. 
but it's nothing special. It's just completely straightforward, you know? I'm just using the fact that two is decidable so I can make the decision here because f and f maps into two. So f of z is an, ele is, is an element of two, f of y is an element of two. This has decidable equality. I can check whether they're equal and make a decision based on this. And then I just get an intuitionistic proof. It's very simple, okay? So that's what Rice's theorem is. It's free, no extra axioms. It just works in every topos, yes? What is needed when is some interesting examples of these. For instance, if you think about just classical sets, which sets have the fixed point property? Classically speaking, ordinary sets. When does a set have, well, when does every endomap from A to A have a fixed point? Only if A is a singleton and no other case. So classically, this theorem is completely un, not, is, is totally uninteresting because it's, 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 it's a triviality because there aren't any interesting instances of it. We will need extra axioms to produce some interesting instances of this theorem. So there, this is a common theme that often you can prove a theorem which is very general, but then to show that it has some interesting instances, you need some extra axioms. Um, for the next thing, uh, I just want to quickly uh, review um, some basic notions, just so that we're on the same page, because constructively these things may matter. So say that a set A is finite, if there is a number N and the subjection from the, the set one to N, so this is the set of all natural numbers less than or equal to N onto A, and uh, we say that E is a listing of uh, A. So this is just the usual thing where you can list the elements of A and you may repeat them. I'm not requiring that they have to be listed each element once. This is also known as Kuratovsky finite sets. Um, then say that a set is enumerable or countable if there exists a subjection. And now I don't say subjection from N onto A because that would exclude the empty set as a countable set. I don't say that a set is countable if it's empty or there is a subjection from N onto A because that is sneaking in some nasty uses of excluded middle that we should avoid. What we say instead is we say that an enumeration of a set A is a, a map from N onto 1 plus A and think of this 1 plus, this is just a, an element, an extra element adjoint to A. So 1 is just some singleton and what this is does is it allows E to skip. It allows E to say, well, I'll be enumerating this guy for a while. I'm not giving you anything in A. So if it never gives you anything, you've enumerated the empty set. Um, but uh, that's a very useful technique and is also very useful. It's, it's something that is known in computability theory is namely this idea of skipping, where you are skipping or stuttering of more often, where you're repeating an element. Um, it's not quite the same. This is more like skipping. Um, when you, we know that A has an element, then we can just say, well, that's the same as having a subjection from N to the A, because if we, if we do have an element, then instead of skipping, we can keep repeating that element. That's stuttering. And we say that a set is, now here's a constructively sensible way of saying uh, that a set is infinite. It's infinite if it contains uh, a sequence. So if there's an injective map from N into A. It would be a bad idea to say not finite because that just ruins any kind of computational value of having infinity. So infinity means you positively can produce the infinitude of elements. Okay. Um, it will also be quite useful to uh, work with multi-valued maps. So a multi-valued map is just a map that may return a set of results. So it doesn't return a single result. It just returns a set of results. And this set has to be inhabited. That is to say, for every x, there is at least one result. And I'm going to write this double arrow to mean I have a map. This is the same thing as a total relation, because you can think of uh, x is related to all the elements of f of x. So there is an easy correspondence here, but it's slightly more convenient for me to, to use the total maps. Okay, so we're almost there. We just need a little more of preparation. Namely, we need to discuss the axiom of choice. So now the, uh, the general axiom of choice can be stated in this way, that every multi-valued function contains a function. I, I think this is a slick way to state the axiom of choice. Um, nevertheless, this is so, the, it's, it's equivalent to the other formulations that you know. Uh, well, 
let's be careful. It's equivalent to the formulation that says that a family of non-empty, a family of inhabit sets has a choice function. Um, it's not valid in the effective topos. It, in fact, it implies excluded middle, and so we cannot take it. But number choice is valid, and so is dependent choice. So this is our first axiom: is number choice or dependent choice. Sometimes we need dependent choice, which is slightly more general. But the number choice just says if you have a a, a family of uh, inhabited sets enumerated by numbers, then you get a choice function. And uh, for instance, it's interesting to think about why these are valid. And for number choice, it's valid because every number has a single realizer. And so that, that, that essentially is the reason. And for dependent choices, because we can define functions by simple recursion. Uh, so it's just primitive recursion, more or less. OK, so we do have number choice. Or can, I, can I ask you a question? Uh, sure. your, your axiom of choice, I don't, I don't understand how that, that can't hold uh, based on your, your definition of what a multi-valued function is. I mean, because you said that you know, for all uh, x and a, there must exist uh, you know, some element of f of x in, I think, we just one slide previous. Right. OK, yeah, so yeah. that's a good so, point. Okay, yeah, that, that's an excellent point. It's an excellent exercise, which I think is worth, 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 it's worth doing, okay? So the thing that is important is to understand what does it mean to realize this statement? To realize this statement, so if n realizes this statement, what does that mean? Well, that means that phi of n, okay, it'll take some realizer here, okay, of some element here, you'll feed it there, and it'll give you some realizer, it'll give you a pair, this will output a pair, And M will realize something here, yes? And then L will realize this business here, that Y is an element of L of X. So it looks like I got a choice function because I just composed this with the first projection, right? And so then I have something that maps K to M and that definitely looks like for every, every A here, right? I can realize a choice function because I get a computable map which is taking these Ks to Ms, right? That's, what, that's why it looks like it's okay. But unfortunately, or fortunately, there is an additional requirement. When you have f from a to b, if you want to realize it, so you suppose this is realized by what, what's the number I haven't used yet, r, yes? It turns out that what you also need is you need to respect equality. That is to say, what could happen here is, suppose I have here an x and both k and k prime realize x. Well, then this procedure will give me m and m prime. But m, my, m might realize an element y and m prime might realize some other element y prime. Whereas this will never happen here. Here, if I have x and it's realized by m, then r will take it to some m, uh, to some l, what is it? k, sorry, if this is k, this will realize it, this, you know, R will take it to some M. This is by R M. And then if I take K prime, another realizer for X, it'll take, it will give me some M prime. But because F is a map, it takes X to F of X. These will both necessarily realize F of X, you see? So a realizer for a morphism respects the equality. A realizer for a for all exist statement need not. It could give me different realizers for different elements, even though I fed it the same, the, the, even though I fed it realizers for the same X. Does that answer your question? This is yeah, the same reason so. why you don't get choice. Uh, yes, thank you. Somebody mentioned that this is pi RK here. Okay, this is getting beyond anything legible here. So for number choice, this doesn't happen because if these are numbers, by the way, if these are numbers, there's only one possible realizer. So you never get into, an, into this conundrum and that's why you get number choice. Okay. Um, now, okay, what's the central theorem of computability theorem? Of course, the recursion theorem. Okay, so the recursion theorem, again, is going to have a, an unrecognizable form at first but it's then easy to see that it's a generalization of the usual recursion theorem with a little bit more work that unfortunately I don't have time to go into, but you can read papers on this. Like if you look at my papers on synthetic computability, there's one about fixed points 
it explains all of this very carefully. So it's like Lavier's theorem. This is actually like Lavier's fixed point theorem, but it's for multi-valued maps. So it says, if you have a surjection, and now earlier we just had A and B, now we need the natural numbers. So if you have a surjection from N to A to the N, then every multi-valued function on A has a fixed point. It turns out this is the essence of the recursion theorem. Often people describe, you know, if you've seen many discussions on how in what sense is the recursion theorem a fixed point theorem and you know then people compare it to various other fixed point theorems. Well, here's another take on it, which I think is a very nice one, namely that it is in fact just a fixed point theorem, but it's for multi-valued maps and that's why it's a little bit mysterious and confusing. And then the proof is like Lavier's proof via diagonalization where you're just throwing one application of countable choice at the right moment and the rest is just the same. Again, it's quite difficult to find interesting examples of this theorem because classically, again, this is not, you know, classically the only set A for which this can happen is if A is a singleton. So this is still rubbish classically, but then if you work hard enough, you can find lots and lots of these sets uh, that satisfy um, this property. Um, so in fact, all countably generated omega CPOs, now that's a lot of them. So a lot of um, post sets that are chain complete and have a countable base. So let's come to the, let's now consider the uh, central axiom. So this is now a true axiom of synthetic computability. Um, and it says the following, you don't know, you almost don't have to read this. Okay, so let's read this. So this is just saying, this is just a formula that says that S is enumerable. Okay, so how do you say that S is an enumerable subset of the natural numbers? There is a function N such that the elements of S are precisely the things which are enumerated by F. Oops, sorry, this mouse is very, should be using this. Um, except that this N plus one trick, which I personally learned from Dana Scott, is allows me to, to skip so that I can also enumerate the empty set. If I keep enumerating zeros, then I, I don't I enumerate the empty set. And so let this script E be the set of all enumerable sets. The axiom of enumerability is simply this. There are enumerably many enumerable sets of numbers. So uh, it just says that this is, an, this is a countable set. Classically, this is very much false, right? It's totally false that, that First of all, classically, every subset of the natural numbers is countable, and obviously there are uncountably many of them. However, this is valid in the effective topos for the simple reason that there is an effective enumeration of computably enumerable sets. Once you translate this back into the effective topos and you think about what it means that you have this F here, it's just saying that, because this is gonna be a computable map, it's just saying that you have a computable enumeration of the elements of S modulo this skipping business. So um, this is going to, in the effective topos, this will be just the uh, assembly we already saw, the assembly of CE sets. And that one does have a total enumeration and it's effectively total, effectively subjective. And so the axiom is validated. And so, because, and let me just use W for such an enumeration because in computability theory, it's always W, so I will also use W. I don't even care which one it is. Uh, I know they will all be iso computably isomorphic. Okay, so what are some interesting, uh, let's, let's, do, let's, let's, let's take some interesting consequences of this axiom. Um, First, something that doesn't require an axiom, which is this, which I will just convince you it's true without proving. Namely, the, you can, so this is the enumerable sets. And this is the semi-decidable ones. A student of computability theory, of course, will learn very early on that that's the same class of sets. The ones that you can computably enumerate are exactly the ones that you can semi decide. So it shouldn't become as a big surprise that in the effective topos, these two sets are isomorphic. You can also just prove this synthetically and it's a nice exercise and you will have to use number choice to do it. Um, but it's not hard at all. Um, so that's good. Ah, but now we have an interesting property, namely both S and E have the fixed point property. That's just Navier. Let's see. So W 
is a subjective map from M to E, but E is S to the N, and it's also isomorphic to E to the N, right? Because this is just, you see, this is just exponential uh, arithmetic. So S to the N is isomorphic to S to the N to the N because N is isomorphic to its own Cartesian product by some nice pairing bijection explicitly. And then this, of course, is just S to the N to the N. That's just exponential arithmetic. And, but that this thing in here is E. So we're back to E to the N. So now we have, now we have a surjection from N to E to the N. So Lavier's theorem kicks in. And we also have a surjection from N to S to the N. So it kicks in for both S and E. But now that they have the fixed point property, now we can start using the fixed point property. Moreover, because this is N, we have the recursion theorem. So now we suddenly have the recursion theorem. We have Rice's theorem. We have lots of, now we're starting to get interesting examples of the classic, of, of, of the traditional, of the well-known uh, theorems. So they apply to, uh, to E. This S is usually not thought of as an object in computability theory because it's a silly two element set with a, with, which encodes semi-decidable truth values, but it's quite useful to operate with it directly. So for instance, this is one thing that you learn when you do things synthetically is that there are these tiny little simple objects which are very useful but they go, they are used all the time implicitly in the traditional arguments. They're just never made explicit. They're just never, they, they, ne they never earn the right to be first class citizens, but they should be. Okay, now we can prove that the law of excluded middle uh, fails. So the law of excluded middle just says that all truth values are decidable, so that's two equals omega. Okay, so why is this not true? Well, because it's quite, because two decidable things of are a decidable truth values are a subset of the semi-decidable ones, which are a subset of all of them, but only the middle one has the fixed point property because these two don't, because, because negation is a, it, negation doesn't have any fixed points and it maps, it maps from two to two, right? Negation from two to two doesn't have fixed points. So two doesn't have a fixed point property. And also the same goes for omega. Negation doesn't have a fixed point on omega. If you try to do negation doesn't have a fixed point on semi-decidable values, this breaks. Because if you take the complement of a semi-decidable set, you're not going to get the semi-decidable set. So negation does not map from S to S. Okay, so here's the last axiom that we need, which is Markov's principle. And here I would like to also show you how the axioms themselves take a synthetic form. So the traditional form for Markov's principle would be something like this. If a binary sequence is not constant to zero, so what is a binary sequence? Well, a binary sequence is just a map from the natural numbers to two. So just some infinite sequence of zeros and ones. Um, so if a binary sequence is not constantly zero, then it contains a one, clear enough. In the logical form, it says, if it's not true, that for all n, f of n equals zero, then there exists an n such that f of n equals one, something like that. Synthetic, so this says, this you can rewrite this into not not exists n f of n equals zero. Uh, sorry, you can rewrite it like this. It's an equivalent form. And you see that this is just the removal of a double negation. So this is saying, Semi decide see, this is a semi decidable truth value. So, this is just saying semi decidable truth values are closed under double negation. So, the synthetic formulation of Markov principle is just S is a subset of Nabla 2. That's it. Or in logical form, it would be for all P in S, not not P implies P. That's another way to say it. So, you don't have to speak about any natural numbers and sequences. You just do it directly in terms of truth values. Um, Post theorem is also a very basic theorem. So let's see how this one works. And you need Markov's principle to prove post theorem. Uh, by the way, why is Markov's principle valid? It's valid because we are using uh, classical logic in the meta theory. When we build the uh, effective topos, we just use classical set theory where Markov principle holds and then it's, that gets transferred to the effective topos. So the traditional theorem of post is this, that a set is decidable if it is semi-decidable and its complement is semi-decidable. And the synthetic one will speak just about truth values. It will say, if you take 
if you know that, so the, the truth values which are semi-decidable and their, their negation is semi-decidable, well, that's gonna be precisely the decidable ones. And then using Markov principle, this becomes an exercise in uh, fiddling with uh, truth values and higher order logic. It's not even higher order, it's just first order. Okay, so um, let's see how am I doing? Ooh, yeah, I'm running slightly over. So let me finish with some remarks about reducibilities. So uh, you can uh, do lots of other interesting theorems, like you know, you can prove that there is a set which is neither finite nor infinite, which is a synthetic way of saying that there exists an immune set. And you can do lots of these things. But let's look at many-to-one reducibilities and Turing reducibilities. Okay, so for many-to-one reducibilities are easy. Okay. So the synthetic definition, let's it would go somewhat like this. A many to one reduction from some set S to some set T is a map which just um, such that S is the inverse image of T, right? Uh, you don't have to keep, you don't have to say computable here because everything is going to be computable anyway once you interpret it in the effective topos. So you just say, well, many to one reducibility looks rather boring here. Nevertheless, you can still prove interesting theorems about it. And also this immediately suggests that there is absolutely no reason why we should be limiting the retention to N, right? Why would we, so, so N is really like the set of realizers. Traditional computability theory always just works with the realizers with bare hands, but really in the background, every computability theorist will think in terms of something like assemblies, except they're never made explicit. So you could just have many to one reducibility for arbitrary subsets. You say, I have a subset S from A of A and subset T of A, and then a map R is a reduction from S to T if S is the inverse image of T, and that's it. And then, for instance, you can show that there exists a complete, uh, a many to one set, which uh, a complete, uh, a set which is complete, many to one complete for the, for the uh, C's, for the enumerable sets, and it will be what you think it is, and the proof is going to be the usual one, and it's just totally straightforward like it is in the, uh, in the usual proof. Okay, so um, let's finish with uh, um, Turing reducibilities. This I consider an unfinished topic, and I know how to give a definition of reducibility, Turing reducibility, which I'm fairly happy with. It's maybe not as synthetic as I'd want it, but I don't know yet how to nicely synthetically prove that there exists incomparable degrees. So the definition is essentially domain theoretic or order theoretic. So say that a poset P is chain complete if every increasing sequence has a supremum, supremum or just an omega CPO. It's directed complete if every directed subset has a supremum. And of special interest are such sets which are generated by a countable set. So if you have an enumerable subset, which by the way also has to have decidable equality, that's a little detail, um, then we say that this is a base if in the case of omega CPOs, every element is the supremum of a chain. And in this case of DCPOs, every element is the supremum of a directed subset of B. And these are very nicely behaved. And let's just, and, and, and this is, and with these, we can uh, speak about oracles. So let's try to speak about oracles. Now, the important thing is to realize that we need to speak about partial oracles. And if you look at how proofs in, uh, Turing reducibilities work, it makes a lot of sense to have partial oracles. So the set of partial oracles is going to be pairs of sets S0 and S1. So pairs of, num pairs of sets of numbers, which are disjoint. And so what you can think of is that you can think of this as a, an oracle. On S0, it's saying no. On S1, it's saying yes. And if you feed it some number which is neither in S0 nor in S1, then it just diverges and your program diverges and you crash. So that would be a reasonable notion of partial oracle. This is to be, okay, so it turns out that a related notion is going to be Plotkin's domain. It's called T omega uh, traditionally. So just take this as an unexplained notation why anybody would call, would, would use this. And it's the same thing, but you insist that the sets S, S0 and S1 are enumerable. These are not really oracles because these sets are enumerable. So you can just enumerate them yourself because, you know, computably, if you think computationally, this means they are computably enumerable. So these are just pairs of these joint computably enumerable sets. Nevertheless, um, it's, it's a useful thing to, to, to have. 
Okay. So now here are some observations. First of all, obviously, the Plotkin's domain is uh, a subset of the uh, partial oracles. It, these are not really oracles because, you know, these will just give you, you could compute them. These are sort of trivial oracles. Um, O is a DCPO, whereas T omega is an omega CPO. And they, in fact, do not coincide because not every set, subset of N is enumerable. Um, and they have a common base. They're countably generated by disjoint finite subsets. So you can take finite sub finite disjoint sets, and those would be like finite oracles, and they everything is generated by them because every set is a union of its finite subsets, and every enumerable set is an increasing, is a union of an increasing chain of finite subsets. Uh, it's interesting to observe what the total oracles are. They're not, they are exactly the classical sets. So they contain no computational content as they shouldn't, because if you're computing something from an oracle, the oracle is not something that's presented to you in a computable way. So it should have zero computational content. So the total oracles, the maximal ones, are what they should be. Whereas the maximal elements of the omega are the decidable sets. So that would be the computable subsets once you interpret them. Okay, so what is then Turing reducibility? Oh, an important synthetic theorem is that every map from T omega to AOT omega preserves supreme of chains. So this is uh, like all maps are continuous sort of theorem, and that plays a role. Okay, so what's Turing reducibility? This is my last slide. A Turing reduction, so you would say, well, what does a Turing reduction do? And one way to do, think of a Turing reduction is that you are reducing, you know, you, a Turing reduction is going to be reducing one set to another set, okay? So you take an oracle, you think of the sets that you're reducing to and from as oracles, you take an oracle, and then the machine goes and it produces another oracle. So it should be a map from oracles to oracles. And we allow for the possibility that maybe it's also partial oracles and so on. But uh, it's not just any map because then you could just reduce anything to anything. Because if you want to reduce B to A, suppose I want to reduce, well, I will not B. Suppose I want to reduce S0, S1 to T0, T1. Well, I just use the constant map, which maps everything to T0, T1. So that's not going to work. It cannot be any map. It turns out that what you need is precisely this, that it needs to be a map which factors to this domain, to T omega, so that it has this sequentially continuous core. It has a core that preserves the prima of chains. And that's important because that gives you a handle on, on the fact that it needs to be computable. So then, some element in uh, some, some total oracle is Turing reducible to another one if there is a reduction between them. And as I said, I don't need, to, I don't have yet have a good, theory, good proof of existence of incomparable degrees. My best guess is that it's going to resemble or will in fact just be an application of the bare category theorem, but it's too early to um, Say anything definite about that. Thank you, and I'm sorry if that I'm running. Yeah, I'm trying running late here. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, especially if we're staying up so late uh, on a holiday in Slovenia. Yeah, it's a national holiday today. It doesn't right. matter because it's almost it's all days are equal. You know, it's we're we're quarantined, so <laughs> it doesn't matter. Right. Anyways, if anybody has questions, please just turn your mic on and. Uh, Ask away. We have a raised hand. Hi. So we Hi. were wondering, uh, in the end, you said you don't have a synthetic proof of the friedberg muchnik theorem. friedberg muchnik theorem relates to CE sets, whereas yes. um, are, are the objects here that you're defining during reductions on CE? Or ah, OK, yes. So that's a good question. So all this thing guy, this guy here, uh, just a sec. Yeah. No. So this guy, these guys here, these are uh, all kinds of oracles. And so actually the ones that you would normally have, if you ask what are the CE degrees, you would take the maximum elements here. So a maximum element here is going to be sets S0, S1. And so an RE degree will be the one where S0 is semi-decidable. 
So those will be the RE degrees. So what you want to say is that the uh, positive part of it is semi-decidable. Okay, but I think what she was asking is why are why, why are you asking for a, a, a synthetic variant of Friedberg Muchek instead of Klini Post? Oh, maybe I'm thinking, oh, both. Well, you would want both, right? Klini Post is just gives you some incomparable degrees, right? Yeah. Whereas and that one, gives you that incomparable one C degrees. So right. the, the, yeah, okay. So the Klini Post should be a lot easier to do synthetically because it is a lot easier to do. Also and classic. I think that a bare category type argument should work there. Right, right. So for, yeah, that's a good point. So first, so this is exercise number two. Exercise number <laughs> two is Klini Post. Just produce some incomparable degrees. Just show that you can't always map anything, you know, this, this business of anything goes to anything, right? Um, just find some. And then this one is trickier because you want also the, the degrees to be, um, to be semi decidable. Is it easy to modify this definition to get enumeration reducibility? Oh, that was my second question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, say again. Is it easy to modify this definition to get enumeration reducibility? Enumeration reducibility. Uh, sorry, what is that? Because I'm not really a computability theorist. An enumeration reducibility is what? Maria? Uh, enumeration reducibility. So you define Turing reducibility by saying that I can compute the elements of A using as Oracle access to the characteristic function of B. Enumeration reducibility says I can enumerate the elements of A if I have an enumeration of B. So there is an effective algorithm to transform a listing of the elements of the Oracle into a listing of oh, the okay. elements. That's a good question. I never thought about that. That's so a I... really, I think it's interesting because that is that arose out of a need for making Turing reductions on uh, partial functions. So, uh -huh. so it models that. So I would immediately suggest, so the, the oracles that are enumerating, again, have to be non-computational in nature, right? So then the question will be, if you know, if I take something like this, what's going on? He doesn't want to, oh, there we go. Uh, you know, this would be computable enumerations. So now you want non-computable enumerations. And non like, for instance, you want a non-computable enumeration of numbers, right? So let's, let's, let's do it again. So that would be like an enumeration of numbers. So if you do something like this, that's a non-computable enumeration. That could be like any set theoretic map from end to end. So then again, my first guess would be that you want, you know, maybe something like this, right? And then again, now it needs to factor through something, but I am hesitant to just use total maps everywhere. This will embed, this will embed, you want to factor like this, but I think we should probably be using partial maps here. So partial computable maps, we need to do something else, some technicality. So I haven't thought about this and I would be pretty certain that you can do it. It's not gonna be whole, totally different from, from what's already there. I suspect that it would be, it's, it's closer in the spirit to the models you're working with these DCPOs. I think like, you know, Dana Scott's like, you know, his D Omega or whatever, like he, he came up with this internal language where the, the operations definable in his language are exactly these enumeration reducibility operators, so. Uh, well, that's another way to do it, where you sort of have a weak theory and the weak theory can define precisely the objects of interest. Here we have a very rich theory, which is higher order logic, but we want, want to make sure that our model sort of has just the right objects. So I think what you're suggesting is like, what you're suggesting is li likely quite useful, but I think is in a different style from this, from this. Any other questions, folks? Alice? Uh, I have a question. Oh, yes. Uh, is there a natural synthetic notion for recursive inseparability of sets? Yes, there is. Uh, some of my old slides have that. I didn't put any in. Let me, um, let me see if I can, maybe I can do it like this. 
now I'm going to have some random thing. Okay, there we go. Um, so why is this? So recursive, in, recursive inseparability, well, what would that be? Well, you would just say, first of all, I'll take an element in T omega, right? That's two, this is, this, that's, so remember what that is. That just means A and B are semi-decidable subsets and their intersection is empty. Okay. Yes. Okay, so this is a domain ordered by pairwise, yes? So what does it mean that this element is, that this is recursively uh, inseparable? This means that it doesn't, there is no maximal element above it. So such a pair A, B is recursively, well, just, you'll just call it inseparable, not recursively because we're doing things synthetically, inseparable if there is no maximal element. above AB in T omega. So this Plotkin's thing is quite useful also for, for these sort of things because that's what, remember the maximal elements of T omega are the recursive sets. So that's exactly a separation of A and B, so this, the decidable sets. I and you can so. prove synthetically that they exist. And the proof is the same as the usual one. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Sure. If not, uh, let me stop the recording.